five. The common fishery policy to a fisherman is like the biggest, most horrible swear word you can have. Four. Shall I do my Margaret Thatcher now? No, no, no. Three. We don't care who gets us out, we just want out. We're still going to be locked down in some shape or form till Easter. I think the important thing now is that we make sure that is then it. One. We have lift off. And welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. So 90-year-old Margaret Keenan from Coventry became the first person in the world to receive a fully approved anti-COVID-19 vaccine on Tuesday, dubbed V-Day by the Health Secretary, a moist-eyed Matt Hancock, (laughs) as the Pfizer vaccines rolled out across Britain, first to the most elderly and their carers. Is everyone set to get the jab? Should it be compulsory? What happens when some refuse? And Boris Johnson's been to Brussels for his last supper with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, trying to secure some kind of free trade agreement. But with almost three weeks until the end of December, when the transition period expires, there's plenty that could still happen. When it comes down to the really serious negotiations, we may yet only be at the Amuse bouche stage, possibly not even on the hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> Do you see any Brexit resolution soon, Alison? Or are we facing talks that go to midnight and beyond. Oh, goodness, Liam. We're back to our favourite game, EU top trumps. The (laughs) clock is ticking on a knife edge. We're in the tunnel. (laughs) We're in the tunnel. How childish is all this? It's always the French. (laughs) The Germans will save us. (laughs) Yes. Angela will get in and say, oh, honestly, how sick are we of all this? She's the only grown-up in the room, (laughs) except that she isn't because she's not even in the room. No, I think she may well be the person to put uh, Monsieur Macron back in his basket. It was absolutely brilliant. I mean, the Mac cartoons on the front of the Telegraph are always a joy, but I particularly like the one yesterday, which was a, a father talking to his little child in bed and saying, only two more sleeps till the next Brexit deadlock. <laughs> <laughs> I think they will do a deal. And I think the sacrificial lamb is going to be Northern Ireland. That... Um, Sammy Wilson of the DUP. He's always red faced, isn't he, Liam? He's gonna be he's gonna explode. His default position is constant outrage. He gives <laughs> that bloke from the SNP a run for his money, he Ian does. Blackford. He when does. Ian Blackford stands up, even in the virtual commons, you can hear it over Zoom. Do you remember when Paddy Ashdown used to the great late great Paddy Ashdown, he used to stand up and the rest of the commons at PMQs, the rest of the commons will go. Mm. <laughs> Ian Blackford gets that now. Because everybody, well, everyone knows whatever's <laughs> happening in the world, it's a kick in the teeth for Scotland. <laughs> well, it's going to be a kick in the teeth for poor old Northern Ireland. Because I don't know if you know, Liam, that Michael Gove said that the EU is going to have officials stationed in Northern Ireland to do checks. And I think we can just about remember, I know it's lost in the mists of time, but Boris definitely promised there would be no border checks. So so now we're down to semantics, really, isn't it? Is an EU official with a clipboard, is he doing a check or isn't he? And and, and we also saw the, the government removing those threatening clauses from the internal market bill, which I, I don't claim to understand, but we were likely threatening to undermine international law. So my guess is that it's Northern Ireland under the bus and they're probably taking the calculation that everyone's so tired with COVID and everything that no one's going to much mind. So what do you reckon? I think it will definitely go all the way to Christmas and beyond. It was always going to. I think there'll be some kind of standstill agreement. So the negotiations Don't shoot the messenger go into the new year as well. The EU's only allowed negotiation over the actual legal text over the last month or so. They've spent so long demanding things before the negotiation actually gets down to it. And I think now we are getting down to the nitty gritty. And the nitty gritty, I think, on Northern Ireland, I'm not sure I agree with you, Alison. I think Northern Ireland will be broadly acceptable in the end after lots of huffing and puffing Mm. to the DUP and the UUP, the unionist community, who, of course, don't want to see any kinds of borders between the British mainland and Northern Ireland, given that, of course, Northern Ireland is constitutionally part of the UK. The EU will have some kind of official presence in Northern Ireland, but I think in the end it will be limited to hot-desking in uh, the city centres 
rather than anything on the border itself. The EU has used the issue of Northern Ireland in an extremely cynical, legalistic, maximalist way throughout this negotiation. It's been deeply disruptive to the ongoing improvement in historic relations between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, something that's very close to my heart, as you know, something Mm -hmm. that deeply affects the lives of myself and my family. I think with this deal that Michael Gove and Brussels has come to over Northern Ireland, I think it's basically the EU parking the Irish issue because they know that the Brits had a point. And of course, the Brits had a point. The European Union was refusing to confirm that it would allow authorised economic operators, the likes of Sainsbury's and Tesco, for Pete's sake, Mm. to freely move goods between the British mainland and Northern Ireland. I mean, completely insane, completely insane what they were doing. And I think that threat has now disappeared. And in turn, as you rightly say, the UK has dropped those threats to introduce the Internal Markets Bill, which was always a safeguard against EU ultra-legalistic maximalism and unreasonableness. So I think Boris Johnson was actually, it's not a popular view, completely right to introduce those clauses. I wouldn't have had Brandon Lewis reading out from the dispatch box that we're breaking in international law. <laughs> not, not ideally, no. I, I think that was just too incendiary. And I think trade negotiators around the rest of the world will think, ah, the Brits are always a soft touch. The Brits, everyone knows, stick to all the rules in the European Union while everyone breaks the rules. The French, the Germans, the Spanish, constantly breaking rules on state aid, constantly breaking rules on the single market, constantly blocking British service sector exports to Europe. And then when we go up against the European Court of Justice, it goes against us because the European Court of Justice is basically a political court, as everyone knows. It's not a real legal court. It's a political court designed to promote the interests of the European federal project. Yeah, I remember interviewing James Dyson and his view on the European court was pretty much unprintable because when you're trying to launch a new vacuum cleaner and you're up against the European court who are siding strongly with Mr. Mealy and Mr. Bosch, surprise, surprise. Always, always. Um, always. But come, coming on to this level playing field, Liam, which I'm quite interested in, I mean, we've had the same standard as the EU, haven't we, for over 40 years. So no other country is going to be as aligned to EU standards as us. And in fact, the irony is British standards are probably higher. We've just seen us banning the transportation of live animals, which we only had to accept that, which is against you know the spirit of an animal-loving nation because that was EU law. I suppose the big issue really is if the EU not just what Michael Gove calls no regressions, which come up, I think, in normal trade deals, but is if the EU want us to obey any new regulations subject to after we've left. And that, I think, is totally unacceptable. We trade with China, but China doesn't get to dictate our laws. And that seems to me to be the fact that will they want to try and retrospectively keep us in their orbit Yeah, it's completely over the top. Look, if British manufacturers want to sell goods on the European mainland within the European Union, they must, of course, adhere to the legal norms of the European Union. That's the law of their land, which is completely fair enough. It's illegal to sell a hoover in Belgium that doesn't conform to Belgium specs, right? Of course, that's completely true. But what the European Union are trying to do now is they're trying to say that all our manufacturing has to adhere to EU regulations. And EU regulations, even when they change in the future, even though we have no say over those changes Mm. at all, because Mm. we're not even part of the European Union. So that prevents us from exporting to other places in the world where standards and norms are different, which is completely over the top. And it's not as if the UK doesn't have the ability to export to the rest of the world. Of, of course it does. And that's what the EU is really, really scared of. Mm. And a lot of our own media is constantly pushing the line that without the great European Union, we'd become some kind of you know, Hayekian, stripped down, <laughs> Ayn Rand market economy wasteland <laughs> where there are just armed militias fighting for survival. You know, this is completely insane. This country, Barbara Castle introduced the Equal Pay Act, Mm. right? The Ford women in Dagenham. We weren't even in the European Economic Community then. That was in the late 60s. 
We don't yes. need the European Union in order to introduce responsible worker legislation, maternity leave. Our maternity leave is better than the European Union average. Our minimum wage is higher than the European Union average. This is the country that introduced, as I said, the Equal Pay Act under Barbara Castle, pioneering legislation in Europe long before the European mainland. This is the country that basically invented the modern welfare state. But the thing that we have to deal with that the European countries don't have to deal with is the six most frightening words in the world, Liam, over to Katya Adler in Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> nice coats. I like it. She does a good white coat and she does a good red coat. And she's a, she's a very clever woman, it must be said. But she always, always takes their point of view. Always. Everything that, everything that Brussels says is sophisticated and sanguine and everything that Britain says is unreasonable <laughs> and stupid. Who's paying your wages, love? Oh, yes, but, you know, that's the deal, isn't it? You know, well, Brussels are very unhappy, says Katya. You think, yeah, well, I was reading up on some French commentator who was saying that the French media have throughout this recent period been keeping a rather diplomatic silence about Brexit. Well, supporting the home team. I mean, can you imagine if the BBC decided to support the home team? I mean, They shouldn't I... support any team, should they, Alison? Mm. Katya Adler... You know, she's a very smart woman, yeah? She's made, actually made some really good documentaries for the BBC that they've been shown internationally, but in recent months they've, they've disappeared. She should be giving a more even-handed rendition of what's actually happening. I think it's a deep psychological blow. I think that's what's behind all this. There's a great, great angst. I mean, we're the second biggest contributor, Liam, to the EU. We were... They're scraping around trying to find 750 billion euros for a COVID bailout plan. They've had a dreadful pandemic. I mean, the thing that really makes me laugh is it's, you know, the EU is always sold to us as this, by the Remainers, as a sort of new seekers. I'd like to teach the world to sing in and perfect harmony. And it with <laughs> love. <laughs> exactly. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow, snow white, white turtle, turtle doves. doves. It's the song I hear. Well, that's that. <laughs> Sorry, that is, I was no. triggered. I was triggered. <laughs> triggered. I know all the verses. It's pathetic, isn't it? It is pathetic. Well, I, I think that's one of the greatest ads ever made, that, that coke ad. But the EU is not used to democracy. And what's going on, I think, is... President Macron is facing an election in 2022. He cannot afford to have the French coastal towns supporting Marine Le Pen. So how much is the fishing deal hanging on Macron's need to shore up his base in these places that he's losing it? I don't know if you read in my column, Liam, Anthony, my husband, was reading aloud from an obituary of uh, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, a former president of France, of course, and, and it said that in... 2004, Destan was set the task of drawing up a constitution for the European Union, and then European heads of state all signed it. But a year later in May, it was rejected by the French people in a referendum. And then a month later, the Dutch voters also rejected this constitution. And Giscard d'Estaing's quote on this was that the rejection of his constitution was a mistake that should be corrected. They are not used to results of referenda being honoured. And suddenly we've got this, you know, bolshy little country, which is us, saying, sorry, we do intend to carry out the result of our referendum. So I think it is a it is a mortifying psychological wound, which which explains, I think, some of the underlying tensions of these negotiations. One of my proudest moments in journalism was back in 2007, and I was at a really obscure financial conference. I was actually one of the speakers there, but I've always got my journalistic eyes and ears open, as you know, Alison. And, and Giscard d'Estaing, a name from our childhood, yes. Valérie Giscard d'Estaing and Herr Schmidt. Oh, yes. You know, at the time, the French and the German economies were going gangbusters and Britain was the sick man of Europe. But as you say, he became an arch federalist in his later life. And back in 2007, I heard Giscard d'Estaing at this uh, conference and he basically, to all the sort of bankers and lawyers and the sort of globalists who were there, he was boasting 
that the European constitution that had been rejected, as you say, by in those referendums by the French and the Dutch, yeah. and the Brits were meant to vote on it and others were meant to vote on it, and suddenly all those referendums were cancelled. Yeah. He said it was being brought back in a, quote, hidden and disguised form yes. as this new Treaty of Lisbon. Mm. And, he, and, and he was literally saying all the substance will be very, very near to the original. The fundamentals of the constitution have been maintained in large part. So, of course... I scribbled all this down and got on the phone to the Telegraph and it got in the, ah, in, it, it was it was scoop. pretty near the front page of the paper. Me and a, a bloke called Robert Watts, who now works at the Sunday Times. I don't know what happened to him, obviously, you know, couldn't stand the pace. All right, Robert, I hope you're doing well. Um, <laughs> and that was when, you know, the world suddenly could no longer deny that this European constitution, flag and anthem and all the rest of it, mm. a huge power grab, a huge, not just ignoring of democracy, but a crushing of democracy, a reigning back of democracy with more and more power being drawn to this Brussels unelected bureaucracy. That's what the European constitution was. And Giscard d'Estaing and his fellow travellers, his fellow federalists, were basically wrapping up all those elements that had been rejected by the French and the Dutch. I mean, two mega, you know, pro-EU countries in the main, two original founding members after the Treaty of Rome of, of the European Economic Community. They'd rejected it and other countries looked set to reject it so they just disguised it. They just hid all these things in this sort of endless mm. treaty, which then went through on the nod with no referendums at all. And that conceit, that was the lighting of the touch paper, I think, of Brexit. Yes. Because it was when that happened, and I remember doing that story, and I'm really proud that I did it, because he couldn't deny it, because I had the recording, right? Mm. He couldn't deny it. Then you had people in the Conservative Party, David Cameron coming in. He had to start saying, well, maybe we will have, you know, it was no longer outlandish to have a referendum because by definition, if this is a new constitution in a country that doesn't have a constitution, then the people should have their say. I think all those people who said that people who voted leave, you know, they didn't know what they were voting for. I mean, that's that sort of Giscard d'Estaing levels of condescension. And I don't know about you, Liam, but that's what gets my back up. That's that's what brings out the stubbornness of the Welsh pit pony stubbornness. I cannot abide it. But they do have to make it look like we've been punished, don't they? Isn't isn't that what has to happen? Because they cannot, what is it, pour encourager les autres or pour décourager les autres. They're having massive problems with Poland and Hungary, you know, with their moving away from the rule of law. It's all turning very nasty in certain parts of the EU. So we have to be on the naughty step and shown to be sent away with our tail between our legs. I mean, or do you, or do you think that the need to sell us lots of BMWs and so on, do you, do you think that will eventually prevail? I mean, do you think Merkel will come in and say to Macron, back off, buster? I don't actually think the French want a deal. I think Macron's calculated that for him, France itself doesn't have a huge trade surplus with the UK. Uh, Paris thinks it's in line to benefit to become more of a global financial capital um, if there's a you know real bad blood between the UK and the EU, even though Paris isn't even in the top 20 global financial capitals of the world and London's number one, number two under some definitions. Mm. So I don't think the French want a deal. I think that's the major dynamic in this. That's why Macron's putting all kinds of mad demands on the table. In the end, it comes down to French and German dynamics, the two giants on the EU side. Macron will be trying to get as many concessions out of Merkel, who does want a deal, as he possibly can. More German money to France, more German money to mm. the club med countries, which in the end will do nothing to prolong the strength and the cohesion and the long-term integrity of the European Union. It begins as a love story. Couples who meet as young activists, bonded in a fight against injustice. We seem to have similar outlooks in life. He often made me feel very special. It felt like we were in love. I remember it being quite magical. As far as I was concerned, we had a future together. I fully did envisage my future with him. But then he starts acting strangely. Suddenly there were secrets and there were inconsistencies and there were things that didn't make sense. Then one day he leaves. I came home from work and I realised immediately that he'd gone. 
vanishes without a trace. And the reason why these men disappear is so disturbing, it's led to a formal apology from the state. I never for a moment thought that it would be what it actually turned out to be. This is Bed of Lies, the true story of one of the biggest scandals in recent British history and the latest podcast from The Telegraph. Talk about the Stasi in East Germany. That's not how we understand our society. A tale that travels from the safety of a loving bedroom to the very heart of the law. Search for Bed of Lies wherever you're listening to this. Now, last week, Matthew Goodwin stowed away with us to Planet Normal, a professor of politics at the University of Kent. This week, we've invited Brian Stewart, who grew up in Fraserburgh on the east coast of Scotland. As these Brexit talks drag on and so many media pundits talk about fishing, we thought it was time to talk to an actual fisherman, one of those who so rarely get to have their say. Brian spent 25 years out on the high seas, bringing in the shoals of herring. Not that there are many herring these days, after years of overfishing under the EU's common fisheries policy. I started by asking Brian what it was like as a boy in Fraserburgh watching the fishing vessels go out to sea. At 11 o'clock every Sunday night, it was just like one boat after another. Every two minutes, another boat would come, another boat would come, another boat would come, and you'd watch them just sail out of the harbour quietly and off into the distance and, and you'd sit there to your mate saying, oh yeah, I can't wait till we left school, that's what we're going to do, that's what our job's going to be. You know, you imagine yourself on the boat, you imagine yourself doing the job, you have no idea really how difficult the job is, you don't really pay attention to the, to the hard work that they're doing, you just think this is what life's about. It was so busy back then, so, so busy. In our home harbour, it was all, still today, mainly prawn boats, shellfish boats, and pelagic trawlers, but there was also a lot of white fish boats, and they work differently. But most boats go on a Sunday night because a lot of fishermen are Christians and they don't believe in working on a Sunday, so they'll wait till 11, 12 o'clock on a Sunday, then they go to sea. And in the high street on a Sunday night in the town, all the young teenage fishermen, every Sunday night, would come down in their new cars, their flash BMWs, their Mercs and everything with the money they were making at sea, and they'd just go around in a circle, they called it the circuit, and it was just a great time to be in around that, because everybody wanted to do it. And at school, most people just knew they weren't even going to sit their exams, most of them. It was just going to be straight to sea. I took a different option. I, I served my time first, and I, as soon as I, the week I finished serving my time, I went straight to sea, just in case it never worked out. It was a bit more sensible. But... We used to sit down the shore, especially in the rough days. These are the days before computers, you know. Foghorn would go off. You couldn't see anything out to sea for the fog and the low cloud. You'd sit down by the lighthouse and hear the foghorn going off, a really spooky, eerie sound. But in the smell of the, the fish processing factories, and you'd see all the women walking to, to work. To, they were employed as fish fillers, working in the processing lines. It was just a, a different, different life and all that non-existent now. So the Fraserburgh of your boyhood, it was very much a a vibrant fishing village. You had Peterhead just down the coast, of course, an even bigger fishing centre. What's Fraserburgh like now? How do you feel when you look around your hometown and you look at the state of the fishing industry? In fairness to Fraserburgh, they had to adapt to the changes. Every town, I think, is universal that high streets have come under extreme pressure and they've all looked like ghost towns. But a small town like Fraserburgh just is totally reliant on the sea. Everything is geared around that industry. In the 90s, everything just started shutting down. The drug problem started, the drink problem started, and it just became one of the... It became a hellhole for a long time. And it had one of the worst drug problems in Europe because so many people were out of work. All the fish processing factories were closing down, farms that had been open for years and years. And that coincided with the decommissioning, right, when the European Union forced decommissioning on the Scottish fishing industry, saying that you had to basically scrap your boats for very little compensation. Tell us what your town went through and what the Scottish fishing industry went through as a result of this EU-imposed decommissioning policy in the 1990s. 
The decommissioning was based on an EU principle and the common fisheries policy called equal access principle. So every time a new member state joined the EU, the share of the fishing quota reduced. And because Britain had the biggest resource, we had the biggest capacity to fish. So our fleet was the biggest. And every time a country joined, that meant our fleet had to reduce, our quota had to reduce. And the only way they did that was restrict our days at sea, restrict our quota, and the fishing boats were basically given the option, would you take £28,000 for your boat or you get nothing, and you have to scrap your boat and you get a certain amount of time to do that. Once you sign the paperwork, you had to sail your boat over to Denmark, to a, a yard in a Hansard in Denmark, and you had to basically oversee, stand there and watch while they scrapped your boat with officials watching on. They would watch to make sure it was done properly. And there was men in tears crying at their boats getting scrapped. A boat that becomes part of your family, becomes part of your everything. To, I mean, a fisherman, especially the skipper of a boat, if he's been on that boat for 20 odd years, he's on that boat every day. Even when he's not at sea, he's down at the harbour on that boat. To get that torn away from you is heartbreaking. What's it like, Brian? Explain it to us landlubbers. What's it like when you're out there on the high seas fishing for a living? It's a very hard thing to describe. You know, there's certain jobs in this world that are, are only a certain type of person can do. And I believe, well, fishing has to be one of them. You've got to have something in you to do it. Basically, you've got to be a complete nutcase <laughs> to do that job. I'm not, you know, you have to have something inside you that you're just a bit mad. Because no matter how crazy you think you are, your skipper, the skipper of your boat is going to be 10 times worse. Because even sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're standing in the quarter deck and your oil skins away to haul your net and it's a force 10 gale outside. The wind is battering you. The waves are falling on top of you. And you're looking at the other guys in the crew and you're thinking, what the earth are we doing here? Why could we not be ashore in our beds? And uh, you just think, I wish the skipper would take us home in this weather. And you just know for a fact that that's just never going to happen. No matter what the weather is, unless it's extremely bad, you fish through it. You learn to take the rough with the smooth, right? I mean, it must be fantastic sometimes a year. I mean, some people might think there's more bad to outweigh the good, but I don't see it that way. I think there's far more. I've had many nights when I've been sitting on my own up in the wheelhouse on watch. Everybody's in their bed and we're towing. So the engine's just going very slowly. You can hardly hear anything, just the water lapping against the boat. The nets are out in the back. You're towing at three knots, so you can hardly hear any noise. It's a full moon. You can see the, the northern lights in front of you. Sometimes, if you're very lucky, you'll see a killer whale or a dolphin or a, a porpoise at the bow of the boat. You just think to yourself, this is the best job in the world. This is clearly in, in your blood, Brian. I know you have many, many deep friendships across the Scottish fishing industry and the broader British fishing industry. Just describe the mood during the 90s as decommissioning was happening, as British fishing quotas were getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, till we reached the point now where two-thirds of the fish caught in British waters are not caught by British vessels. How does that feel to you as a fisherman? The common fishery policy to a fisherman is like the biggest, most horrible swear word you can have. It is just the bane of their life. Every time you say that word, they just think it's just evil beyond anything else for what it has done. And in the 90s, when this first started, or when it first started having an impact on the fleet, I was young at the sea. I'd only been at sea a few years. But when you're a crew of six men on a boat, you know, everybody knows each other very well and you you know each other's moods, you know when things are changing. For the first year, when changes started to be introduced, nobody understood what was going on because fishermen are not interested in politics. Fishermen just want to go and do their job. All of a sudden, all these Spanish boats just started appearing and they were all going for the sand eels. And I remember at the time thinking, what is, why are they fishing for sand eels? Nobody, nobody eats them. No, I could never make any sense of it until it was years later that I found out the, the truth behind it. There was no quota on the sand deals for about a year, and all the Spanish boats were just given carte blanche to catch as many as they want. And the, the only issue that we had at the time, before we started to realise how unfair things were going to become, is we saw Spanish vessels breaching the 12-mile line, which was really our only protection. So inside the 12-mile line, 12 miles from the British coast, 
that's exclusively British zone, right? As it is for every country. It is in the in the EU. Yeah, it's it's and it's the only protection really we've got that we can take any action against boats that are doing anything illegal. But it felt like it was just the Wild West for a while. There's no accountability, and it still feels like that today. There are instances like this happening all the time that don't get reported. But back then, we didn't understand what was going on. We didn't see what was coming down the road because it was all politics. How do you feel hearing on the Tea Time news pretty much every night at the moment? Oh, fishing, it's a tiny proportion of the British economy. Boris Johnson would be mad if he scuppers a whole EU deal just on the strength of fishing. How do you feel when you hear that on the mainstream news? Oh, it drives me insane. I just think to myself, how uneducated are these people? Which other industry in this world would they sacrifice the way they are sacrificing our industry? In Scotland alone at this time, there's 2,395 active boats fishing this year. 2,395. Can you imagine if they were all made redundant? That's nearly 5,000 fishermen. And the industry to back that up is in probably 30,000 people. Because the wealth from the fishing spreads out across the town, the port, and then inland too, right? Of course, because you've got the offices that, that deal with the accounts, the fisheries management that deal with the quotas, just the market, the buyers, the sellers, the people that make the nets, the people that do the ice, marine engineers, the grocers, the bakers, the butchers, the net maker, just so many people, the woman that owns the cafe and the fish market, all these people that are employed solely around the industry. Ten years ago, there was almost 5,000 boats. So we've lost 48% of the fleet in 10 years. How did you feel when you heard that the French had put a last-minute demand on the table? Fishing stays as it is. The quotas stay the same for the next 10 years. I have absolutely no sympathy for them. I would give them nothing. And the reason I felt like that is not because part of me did, did think, OK, I'm a fair kind of person maybe a transition period would be good but then i thought back to how how all the guys felt when they were forced to decommission their boats there was no sympathy shown to us none whatsoever we were just basically told this is what's happening if you don't like it tough so nobody gave us any sympathy sometimes you know especially last week i was watching the the news channels and the way that some of the the news readers were speaking about fishing i was just absolutely disgusted they just sneer at us as though we're just absolutely worthless. But I've got a word for them. I call them triangle toast eaters. <laughs> you don't like people that cut their toast into triangles, no? <laughs> because they have no clue. <laughs> what do you say, Brian, to those who argue that a lot of British vessels have sold their quotas, so they've only got themselves to blame? Please tell me how that is possible when quota gets allocated every year. It's not possible. Look, I have to be subjective in this. And I really think that there's a big difference with what's going on in England to what's going on in Scotland. I have done a bit of research and I've spoke to some English fishermen that I know. And I know there are instances of some, what can you say, skullduggery that's went on, but not by independent fishermen. All the fishermen didn't get around a table one night and say, oh, our industry is in dire straits. Maybe it's time we sold our quota to the people that are stealing it from us just now. I just, it just doesn't make sense. The quota cannot be sold when it's allocated every year and your quota is allocated based on your share of the fishery. Looking for work, Brian, as fishing in Scotland diminished, you went to Norway to work in the fishing industry, didn't you? That, of course, is what a lot of people want from the European Union. A Norwegian deal in the sense that we renegotiate the fishing quotas every year. What's it like working in the Norwegian fishing industry, a potential vision for the Scottish and the British fishing industry? They work a completely different way to us. And the reason they can do that, you have to understand how fishing works. I mean, the common fisheries policy has put a stranglehold on the industry. So we can't decide how to manage our stocks in our own waters. It has to come from Europe and the common fisheries deals with that. In Norway, they can do that by themselves. They can make their own nets. They can decide what size of mesh to use so species can escape. So their stocks inland and close to shore are abundant, whereas in this country they're not because they've been overfished by super trawlers that we have got no control over. So you can go in Norway in one of the fjords and you can cast a rod two feet off the shore and you can catch a four-foot coley just in 10 seconds. And that's not an exaggeration. So you think if we left the common fishing policy, we could as a British fishing policy, 
could help to replenish our marine environment with fish, stopping the overfishing of the common fisheries policy? Without a doubt, because the common fisheries policy does not work for looking after and managing our stocks, because by the time the science catches up with what's going on today, it's already a year out of date. And it just takes a simple thing like a half degree temperature in the, in the sea and the fish move. Now, in Scotland, Scottish fishermen know where to go to find the fish. It's a hunting game. You're hunting. So we know our grounds better than anybody else. So if the fish move, we know where to go to try and find them. But the common fisheries policy has put invisible lines in the ocean. So on a computer screen, we can only fish within certain sectors for certain species at a certain time with science that's a year out of date. It makes no sense. So even if we want to go over this certain line to catch, say, monkfish, we're restricted because the quota is not allowing us to do it because we're using information and science that's a year out of date. And we were already managing our own stocks in the early 90s before they came to us and basically forced these common fishery solutions on us that we didn't want. We're quite capable of managing our own stocks in these waters. No fishermen in the UK, in England, Wales, Northern Ireland or Scotland, wants to overfish their sea. We want fairness. That's all we want is fairness. What will happen politically if Boris Johnson, as Edward Heath did, in your view, sells out the fishing industry? What will happen to the SNP support? What will happen in Scotland to the case for independence? The only Tory stronghold you've got in Scotland at the moment are in the fishing areas because, above all else, everything any other fishermen wanted was out of the common fisheries policy. So we want Brexit at any cost. There is nothing that happens, no deal or, or otherwise, that will convince any fisherman that I know that it's not worth it to leave because the common fishery policy has imposed that bad restrictions on us over the years that we would leave at any cost. So if Boris decides that he's going to throw us to the wolves again, it's curtains for him. He's not going to get back into Scotland, that's for sure. And I don't understand this mentality from the SNP that they want back into Europe and they want to sacrifice the fishing industry to do it. You know, I was an SNP supporter, but there's a red line I have in the fishing is, is it to me. I don't care who's in power. Consecutive governments over the years have not looked after the fishing at all. In fact, they've just totally destroyed us. We've been like an afterthought. So we don't care who gets us out. We just went out. Well, I have to say, Liam, that was an absolutely wonderful interview and you did it so well uh for me brian i feel quite tearful yeah, you know just so such a dignified man not matt hancock tearful actually yeah. proper person tearful because brian seems to me to sum up the best of planet normal and he painted such a vivid picture of the romance of this really brutal calling going out to the high seas and yet at home this rich community men women and children all benefiting from the wealth of the sea, all mutually interdependent, thriving with their nice cars that have been bought back from, you know, bought on the back of the fishing. And then suddenly that devastating picture he painted of the fishermen standing there and watching while these men with the clipboards made them scrap their boats that were part of their own family. They got 28 grand for each boat. Uh. Regardless of the size or the value of the boat. Now, 28 grand would barely buy you a sailing dinghy. These, I mean, even back then in the 90s, we're talking about boats even then worth hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds upgraded through the generations by families. Their whole lives and livelihoods of families and extended families contained in, in one physical object that was then scrapped in front of them and they were given a cheque for 28 grand, which is, you know, a family car. We're media commentators. You know, we hear about, oh, yes, the fishermen, the commons fisheries policies. We've got some vague idea that the French and the Spanish came in and started fishing our waters, don't we? But there's Brian actually telling us that this fisheries policy was, in his words, evil beyond belief. I mean, it was environmentally a disaster. Uh, it was brutal that this wonderful, lively community that he grew up in suddenly became a kind a ghost of... ghost town, as he said, a ghost town. Absolutely. And and I think it, it brings me to this that marvellous phrase where you were really laughing, weren't you, about the triangle toast eaters? 
And that's, <laughs> you know, that's the media commentators. That's the people talking out of their backsides when people like Brian and, and his colleagues knew exactly what was being done to them and the tens of thousands of people's lives that were destroyed by this collusion by Europe and indeed by our own government. And I don't know about you, Lynn, but it, it really made me feel if Boris sells these people down the line, I'm finished. That you know, That's it. It's worth just recounting a little bit of the history here because you so rarely hear it. You know, there was no common fisheries policy until literally the days before Britain joined in 1973. Mm. And then it was sprung upon Edward Heath at the last minute, hours before. And unless he agreed to it, then the French were going to veto Britain's entry again, as they did twice under de Gaulle in the 1960s. And for Heath, his whole you know, mission in life was to get Britain into the European economic community, as was. And George Pompidou, who was French president then, just played on his vanity and Heath sold out the fishing industry. Mm. And it took it took a few years, as as Brian recounted, but within a decade or so, Boats were being decommissioned across this country and very little compensation was offered. And and you heard it from Brian, a lot of fishermen, and I've spoken to fishermen in recent years. I've covered this sector mm. quite quite a lot. And I, I wrote a book about Brexit. As you know, there's a chapter in there on fishing. Mm. For a lot of fishermen, they were, of course, up for some kind of transition period. Out in the high seas, there's sometimes high jinks and aggression between fishing boats but they also help each other out it's like the law of mm. the sea uh, and they will know they will have friends and colleagues in fishing communities across europe and a lot of fishermen i've spoken to they are up for a transition period but not the standstill agreement for 10 years that's just crazy what macron's now putting on the table and you know the french fishing industry is even smaller than the british fishing industry as a share of the population, something that, again, you never hear on our own British Tea Time news, because it's always seemed to be completely ridiculous to do anything to protect the fishing community. And surely we've got to protect the city itself. Look, the city can look after itself. OK, mm. the city has been front and centre in this debate, funding the Remain camp 19 to the dozen all throughout the, the referendum yeah. and beyond trying to get a second referendum, the big banks and the law firms and the big accountancy firms and all the rest of it, desperate to keep the single markets, they will do just fine. They, they should be completing globally anyway. Mm. And in many ways, the European mainland needs our financial services industry a lot more than we need theirs. You know, when the German government wants to raise money, it floats bonds on the city of in the city of London, you know, it doesn't because <laughs> the, the German financial capitals are too small, the markets are too small. So I'm I'm really glad that we've given Brian some kind of platform. And I think in the end, it won't be fishing that scuppers this deal. Fishing may get the blame because fishing it can can be a number it can be a number and as long as the number is reasonable and a big improvement on where we stand then boris has got a foothold in scotland still the tories can rebuild in scotland and that's my biggest fear alison if boris sells out fishing you're not going to get anyone voting for the conservative party in scotland for a very long time yeah. and i care less about that than i care about the smp getting even more support and us losing the union. For me, it strikes me that either he backs fishing or the UK breaks up. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much sums it up. I mean, something that Brian said, which I think leads on to this other story that's been happening with Sky News this week with um, Kay Burley, one of their presenters. I wrote about it in the column this week. I mean, it seems like a kind of gossipy story about Kay Burley going out with nine of her mates to a London restaurant for a birthday celebration, then going on to another restaurant and then going back to her own home. We don't know quite all the details yet, but we do know that some of the Sky people who were involved have been taken off air temporarily. And the, the link, I think, comes back to what Brian said about the triangle toast eaters. You know, these people who presume to stand in judgment, the mainstream media, which we've said often on Planet Normal, haven't we, throughout this period has represented one very tunnel-visioned view of lockdown, which has been immensely punitive to ordinary people all across the country. And I feel that this uh, anger, this backlash now with these Sky News presenters is of a kind of us and them. 
And that's what Brian's speaking about for the fishermen who look at the tea time news and think that's not what my industry's like. And this is, you know, it's it's a it's a widening gulf, isn't it, between the mainstream media, which has I think let us down during this absolutely vital part of our history. I think all people in public life, Alison, whether they're politicians or high profile journalists have to be extremely careful. And I think as the vaccines rolled out, and we do think that's good news, don't we? Yeah. I think there are going to be lots of debates being launched, not not about whether or not there should be a vaccine. I think there should be a, a vaccine, but how we roll out this vaccine. Once we start getting the 3.2 million people above 80 fully vaccinated and their carers, mm. and then the Oxford vaccine will come in, which seems to work very, it's much quicker and it's cheaper, it's easier to distribute because it doesn't have to be kept at such cold temperatures. Maybe that can then speed mm. up and we can get the over 70s, the over 60s, the over 50s if they want to. I think as that process happens, more and more people are going to say, okay, now let the young people go mm. free. Now let's get the economy moving. Now let's move to a more kind of Great Barrington Declaration type setup yes. where we age stratify, where we realise that there is now almost no danger to people in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s. And there's a lot less danger to their older friends and relatives and fellow citizens because those people are now inoculated. There's been a lot of a lot of news this week about maybe the ONS numbers, the Office for National Statistics numbers. They've been revised backwards. So was the... That was, was the scandal. Was the, Come was on. That, was that, that, is, that is definitely a scandal. Mm. That's definitely a scandal. Uh, but I do detect, I do detect, particularly from Matt Hancock and some other cabinet ministers, some movement now. Maybe they may move to a more age stratified approach as the vaccine is rolled out. We're still going to be locked down in some shape or form till Easter. I think the important thing now is that we make sure that is then it. Completely. Because the economic damage that's being done with each month with each week with each day is enormous i agree with you and i know that there are various planet normal listeners who are very upset and they get in touch and they say why are you and liam so uncritically pro-vaccine i would put it differently i think that the vaccine is the great barrington declaration as you said by other means yeah basically there's been a refusal by the government to come clean and say this virus really only affects is only a danger to the very old and to the vulnerable so that now what we're seeing is an is a tacit acknowledgement by the vaccination of the over 80s first and the vulnerable that in fact Sunetra Gupta professor Gupta is completely right but I absolutely agree with you so strongly. First we, for everything. <laughs> I think it's happened once before, hasn't it? Go on. Just get me give you a tiny example. I was talking to a friend yesterday who works in a nursery school, all right? Little tiny children, three-year-olds. Is this a Velma moment? <laughs> No. Well, it's a kind of it's a human Velma moment. It's not human Velma. I mean, okay, you know, on. I could trot out all the stats, but she is not allowed <laughs> when the little tiny children are having lunch. She is not allowed to take the lid off their yogurt or fromage fray pots because that would be dangerous, Liam. Okay, that's not COVID safe. So the children, tiny children go home without having had enough to eat because it's COVID secure. This is the kind of lunacy we have seen both at the Robert and Josephine end of things and at the tiny children end of things. And yesterday, Telegraph had a big story, Sir Patrick Valance, oh, the public may have to wear masks for another year because of a lack of evidence to show whether the vaccine prevents transmission. And shall I do my Margaret Thatcher now? Go on then. No, 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 absolutely not. You are I'm not I'm enjoying this. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. We are not going to have... She wants to be the governor. <laughs> oh, yes, do you remember, do you remember that? Dennis, you remember, oh, Dennis Skinner. <laughs> one of the best moments ever. Oh, God, we miss oh, them, don't we? Yeah, Dennis Skinner. You're trying to make a three-course meal out of a pan of boiling water. <laughs> 
But we need some of that. God, imagine the emails about that as some kind of, you know, somewhere in the North accent. That was meant to be Yorkshire, but please don't, don't, mercy, mercy. We haven't, we haven't unleashed your full Irish on people yet. That will be. A... No, no, they're but not I, ready for but it. They're I not think ready that for my, it. My big fear is that these scientists have got a taste for power now. So Patrick Valance, chief scientific officer, who is saying we might have to go on wearing masks possibly indefinitely because we don't know whether the vaccines prevent transmission. Who was it, Liam? This is your starter for 10. Fingers on the buzzers. Right, fingers on the buzzers. Which leading scientist said that the evidence supporting the use of masks was very weak? Uh, Halligan, Planet Normal. <laughs> Sir Patrick Valance? It is. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, very Cue good. teddy waving Cue... and scarf kind oh, of ruffling. Absolutely. So basically, <laughs> you know, you alluded to earlier the ONS data, which Valance and Witty trotted out at the end of October, saying, you know, cases were rising at an alarming rate. And that sent us into full lockdown in November, didn't lockdown it? lockdown in November. Oh, an- another, another umpteen thousand businesses trashed. Absolutely. And they claimed that there were 44,100 daily infections on the 17th of October. Here's Velma. <laughs> There's Velma. <laughs> we, can't yeah, let, we can't leave Velma out the whole thing. But in this revised thing, so 44,000 has suddenly gone down to 26,600 daily. Isn't that strange? Wow. And what I noticed this week is we've had... Is Velma this week in her soesters and her <laughs> fishing know, wellies? With the sea spray over her glasses forget, and the, forget hospital, the orange hospital, roll neck. hospital bed occupancy. Someone's <laughs> yeah, yeah. going to become herring correspondent. Yeah, fish gutter in chief. <laughs> yeah, I think that's more your kind of thing, really. Um, I'll go. I'll go out on Brian's trawler, but only if I've got like a, a special room. But look, let's just, 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 just. Can I make? Can I make this point? Can you stop laughing? A, a special helicopter that sort of hovers <laughs> yes. overhead and just say hi and then bugger off back to the mainland. Absolutely. In my design is that way. <laughs> with this week, we did see with that shocking ONS figures, you know, being being revised down very quietly. Robert Peston, ITV's political editor, who's been pretty, you know, towed the government line throughout. Peston was suddenly highlighting this extraordinary discrepancy between what we've been told and what the new figures showed. And we saw a report on Channel 4 News on excess non-COVID deaths. And suddenly, I think we're getting a little Where bit... Where have they been for the last six months? I know. But we've been leading oh. the charge, darling, haven't we? You know, oh. we, we have done our... We have done our best. Yeah, now it's too late. Now we've had the lockdown. Suddenly we're all over the numbers from October. I think the scientists, I said in the column this week, you know, that the geeks have inherited the earth and we want it back. We just want it back now. They don't understand human beings. They don't understand little children in nurseries not being able to have their yogurt because the teacher isn't allowed to touch the lid from of the our yogurt. Tray, darling, from, from our, our tray, darling. From our tray. Exactly. So I think it's about it's about insisting now that this can't be allowed to go on indefinitely because it's it's not just damaging, obviously, economically, hugely damaging at the micro level. And I want to see people's faces, Liam. I you know, was in John Lewis the other day. I, sometimes you look around and you can't quite believe what's happened to us, can you? So it's on to our readers' emails, our favourite part of the podcast. Please keep your mails coming into planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Liam and I absolutely love reading them, learning about how you're all thinking and feeling and fuming, our wonderful fellow citizens of the Planet Normal community. Here's an email I got in response to my piece about Kay Burley and the hypocrisy of ignoring the rules that you've been championing. Um, Tim says, this perfectly exemplifies why most people in this country, the so-called silent majority, utterly despise the hypocritical, woke, prosecco-sipping elites, actually Brian would say a triangle toast brigade, that infest our political class media. TTBs. TTBs. <laughs> And cultural institutions. I well remember the vain, pulsating anger etched in Kay Burley's face as she attacked and excoriated Dominic Cummings over his trip to see his parents' house at the beginning of the lockdown. What a barefaced hypocrite she is. This one from Nick. Dear Alison and Liam, the tier system means the pubs are virtually unworkable, with very few exceptions. I visited my local on Friday as they were doing food. Nobody was allowed to share a table, so my wife and I spent 10 minutes in a back room, then had to wait for our drinks and food. If we attempted to move about the pub, we were told to sit down. We felt like kids in detention, and when we finished, we were told to leave. The nearest we got to social interaction was to wave at our friends across the room. It was a miserable, soulless experience. Never again. 
Why has the government got it in for pubs? There is zero evidence pubs are the source of infection. COVID's largely contracted in hospitals, care homes and in people's houses. So many pubs are in danger of disappearing forever. And that would be an economic and social disaster for millions of ordinary people. And this is from Mary. I have just found this quote. Safety is all well and good. I prefer freedom. It's from The Trumpet of the Swan by E.B. White. I was born in Kent's Bomb Alley in December 1941, free-range childhood, roaming around South London and North Surrey on walks and public transport since March. I am living that quote every day. Love your podcast. Can't wait for Thursdays. Thanks so much, Mary. Jerry in Wiltshire. Please can you help me as the media is driving me mad? It's good news society's recognising and caring about mental illness. However, it now seems that the majority of the UK population has a problem with their, quotes, mental health. Years ago, we used to say we were just worried, anxious, nervous, depressed, sad, cheesed off. <laughs> However, in today's world, if we're not happy all the time, we must have a problem. Really? The media are feeding this frenzy of people self-diagnosing and apparently every student suffering from some form of mental illness. Clearly, some people really do need help. But can the media and the BBC in particular stop diluting their cause? This is from Andy. I was thinking about how little television and radio I actually consume compared to a few years ago. Every TV programme seems like some sort of government re-education programme designed to cure me of my inherent racism, misogyny, homophobia, etc. And it's not just the BBC, although I am paying their public school boys and girls to lecture me. As for the media's take on the Millwall game, when will they understand that you can be passionately against racism and not support Black Lives Matter? That's something, Liam, that cropped up in my column this week when I was writing about the Vicar of Dibley, where Dawn French playing the Re Reverend Geraldine takes the knee in the middle of this well-loved sitcom about English village life, which has caused a little bit of annoyance, I think we can say. Here's one from Sue. On Sunday, I FaceTimed my brother, who lives in Norway. It's where I'm from. And I was envious at his casual, we're going to the neighbours for lunch today. They're simply unable to comprehend over there the situation as it is here in Britain. There is Covid in Norway, but they seem to have a proportional reaction to it and live with it, with advice to the elderly and the vulnerable to take care and shield themselves if they feel worried. My parents are in that category and would both have been horrified to think that their grandchildren would have to stop their lives and destroy their future for them. At no point has society in Norway been shut down like it has here in Britain. Sounds like Norway's the place for a planet normal outing, Liam. Just going to finish with two tiny ones. Judy says, it is suggested by Sage that you put granny by an open window for Christmas dinner. That's all right then. There won't be any of us left by January to catch the virus. We will all have died from pneumonia. Just one example of patronising advice. Best wishes to you lovely grown-up people at Planet Normal. This is my favourite one-liner, Liam. This is um, of the Amish community, you know, the people who yeah. live separately in the States. The Amish were asked, why is COVID not affecting your community? They replied, we don't have television. <laughs> <laughs> that brilliant so that's it for our latest voyage to planet normal strap yourself in for re-entry to the madness of planet earth keep your spacesuit handy for next week put a saucepan on your head because we're back next thursday for another blast off in our rocket of right thinking our capsule of common sense every thursday at 11 a.m co-pilot halligan and i chat to fellow planet normal citizens via the telegraph website do join us this week to show some love for brian that wonderful fisherman you just go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash community and you click on the article at the top of the page leave a comment in the comment section and between 11 a.m and 12 noon liam and i will reply to them please come and join us you can read alison in the telegraph and online every wednesday and me every sunday and also, this coming Sunday, the 13th of December, Alison and I are both taking part in the Telegraph charity phone-in. <laughs> we are. I'm going to have to dig out a Christmas jumper. You, you, you just want to see Halligan with his uh, reindeer antlers <laughs> <Dealey> on. Dealy boppers. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can ring the Telegraph, pledge some money to a range of excellent causes. And all of the people manning the phones are Telegraph writers like us. The details of how to do that are in the show notes to this episode or on the Telegraph website. And if you pay enough money to one of the charities, I'll let you insult me and Halligan together. How's that for an offer? (laughs) <laughs> we put us in the rhetorical <laughs> stocks, stocks and throw wet sponges at us. <laughs> exactly. So in the meantime, stay safe, stay in touch with family and friends, stay in touch with us, and we'll be back with you next week. And as our beloved planet normal fades out of sight after our latest trip, an Earth Hoves interview, thanks to our producers, Reese Gunter, Louisa Wells, Elliot Lampitt, and our editor, Theo Leludis. Until our next voyage, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs> <laughs>